posted this on the R Flying subreddit, but they sent me here because they think you all could be of more help to me. I'm writing this in my motel room here in Farmington, New Mexico, because I don't know what to do, and I don't really know what's happening. For clarity's sake, I added in some backstory to help provide some context. Maybe I missed something that someone could point out for me to help me out of this predicament. My name is Rig. I graduated from my university's pilot program a little over a year ago, and I was lucky enough to have made some golden connections to get on with a Part 135 flight chartering company flying Cessna Citation CJ-3s. Back in June of 2022, the company wanted to change from an authorized single-pilot operation to a multi-pilot operation, with the caveat that they didn't want to pay the co-pilot very much. Being a junior pilot, I was all too happy to accept almost literal peanuts for pay, as long as I got my type rating and multi-engine turbine time under my belt. My designated pilot examiner, or DPE, who helped me sign off for all of my licenses, is one of the chief pilots, and after asking him about any job opportunities, he was open to nominating me for the position. During onboarding, I learned more about the charter operation and what we did. While we would, of course, fly around a bourgeois rich family here or there for vacations, we focused primarily on medevac-type transport jobs. Taking a small crate with a human heart for transplant from Denver to Seattle, taking an eye specialist doctor from Boise to Los Angeles, flying a rich guy to get his fourth cosmetic surgery of the year and it's only March 24th, that sort of thing. That's about 80% of our clientele. It's a fantastic first real flying job. To help underscore this for anyone here who isn't a pilot, this is a unicorn level job opportunity that I have been incredibly grateful for and lucky to have. I'm very lucky to be working with my mentor, Brandon, and one of my friends, Kyle. Due to its importance to my little problem, I have a couple of words about Kyle. He's a good friend and a good employee. Kyle had recently become a sort of intern from the university that wants to work for us when he becomes a pilot, he himself holding a new commercial pilot certificate. Knowing that, whenever we have flights on Monday or Wednesday afternoons or evenings, he tags along and sits in the back to act as a type of flight attendant when needed. He always has a really good attitude and is eager to do anything that helps us out. And that helps take away some of the more mundane tasks for me, so I can concentrate on pilot work, versus filling out logs and paperwork for flights. For people familiar with air operations, he takes on a bit of a dispatcher role for us sometimes, and builds flight plans and weather briefings that the pilot will look over and approve or improve upon. Because Kyle and I are so close in age, and we know and are friends with some of the same people from the university's flight school, we quickly became friends ourselves. Last week, though, that loose definition of friend was really put to the test. I woke up to a drunk call from him at 01.30, asking me to pick him up from a local bar. When I walked in to find him and asked what was going on, he informed me that he and his girlfriend were having a spat and she had broken up with him. When he was done crying, I told him to pull himself together, drink some water, and I took him back to his apartment. Since then, we've been good friends, playing Hell Divers 2 and Hunt Showdown together with a few of our common friends, and really just having a good time when I have time. Coincidentally, him and his girlfriend were able to work some of their issues out with advice from my wife, who's a licensed MFT, and he's been able to get back on track. Overall, my job may be a lot at times, but I'm absolutely in love with it. I guess until a few hours ago when all that changed. I've been flying for the past two days now, doing point-to-point pickups for my company with one of the other senior pilots. Needless to say, I was exhausted as we got back into my home base here in Utah earlier today. It was snowing pretty bad the other night and into this morning, so after I did all the grunt work of getting the plane back into the hangar and finishing logging the Hobbs tack times for the plane, I went into the pilot's room upstairs near the only heater in the building. The plan was to have a quick hot drink, get the flight plan ready and filed, and to take a three-hour nap before the next turnaround in New Mexico. I turned on the electric kettle 
sat down on the couch, pulled out my iPad, and texted Captain Brandon that everything was going to be ready before he got here. After that, I texted my buddy Kyle to let him know we had a flight at 1700, and that it would be a rare overnight flight because the cargo we were transporting had a destination that was also a pickup spot for our trip tomorrow morning, transporting for the same hospital. I texted Kyle that he was more than welcome to come along and see what it was like to pick up a tissue sample from a medical courier on field, and get the experience, even if it meant he would need to spend the night in Farmington, New Mexico with us. While I got up to make myself a hot drink, I looked out the window through the light snow at the woods across the way. Through the tree's branches off to the right of the window, I saw a buck elk standing there in front of the trees across the road on the other side of the airport fence. It was looking at me. It didn't look correct. I first noticed with the eyes. Even from this distance, the eye angled the best to my vision just looked like nothing. A single black pit. Looking more closely, the animal looked hungry. I know in winter time there isn't a lot to nibble on for them, but this one looked worse than I had seen of them around this time of year. Even from up here, and a little more than a hundred feet away, I could see the outline of its ribs. As I was staring at it from inside the building, I just kept getting this weird feeling because I was so interested in looking at this elk. I stepped closer to the window, but I don't actually remember any conscious effort on my part to do so. It was almost magnetic. I felt almost mesmerized, looking into the points of black. As I walked up to the window, everything started to sound distant. Things became more and more muddled. I subconsciously noticed the click from the kettle turning off in the rolling, boiling water, but it sounded so distant. My footsteps on the hardwood portion of the kitchenette didn't creak. The crunch from the crisp carpet didn't whisper. All I could hear was the silence and a light wind from the light snow outside through the window. The bull elk was still facing me, its onyx eyes still looking towards me standing in the kitchenette of the hangar's upper mezzanine. As we locked eyes for what both felt like an eternity and only a split moment, I saw it shudder a movement. That's when I saw it stand up on its hind legs. In utter silence, I witnessed the elk stand. Carefully. Knowingly. I watched as it slowly walked on its legs as a man would, creeping with each deliberate step finding purchase through the snow and on the icy ground below. I watched in horror as it crept closer to the fence line, crouching under tree branches that would have inhibited its constant stare. I don't remember any noise coming out, but I remember I was screaming. The vision of the elk disappeared from my view as I fell backwards from the window. The next thing I remember is waking up on the couch screaming. As I leaned up looking towards the window, I saw Kyle sitting on the armchair in the corner of the room reading one of the aviation weather books we have on the coffee table. He quickly lowered the book with a blank startled look. Hey Kyle, sorry about that. Just had a bit of a nightmare, I think. I hope I didn't scare you. No, I'm fine. Good to hear it. Hey, thanks for coming with the snow being as bad as it is. I hope we'll be able to just de-ice and head out when Captain Branding gets here. I hope the airport snow removal team is keeping the runway clear. It's always a drag to have to wait for them. As I got up, I went over to the kettle and started boiling the water again, as it was only lukewarm because of my nap. The rest of the prep went rather smoothly, albeit a bit more delayed than I would have liked. Due to my nap, I caught a bit of a lecture from Brandon about filing IFR flight plans earlier than I had, and I was outright criticized for not pre-flighting the airplane before he arrived. During the pre-flight, Kyle got on board the airplane and was just super stoic. He would answer us, giving generally one-sentence replies and looking back out the window of the passenger cabin. He just wasn't being his positive and generally laid-back self. Knowing about his relationship issues, I really didn't push it, fearing his girlfriend may have pulled the plug on their relationship again. But being at work and with Brandon around, I didn't want to ask. The rest of the flight went on as normal. I finished pre-flighting, turned off my phone, called up the clearance delivery frequency. We departed. Pretty standard stuff. 
We got into Farmington just fine, handed the plane over to the FBO after meeting with Guardian, the medical courier company who was taking the tissue sample to the hospital, and we rode in the FBO car to the motel after we got food at the bar and grill on the airport by the control tower. I'm currently sitting here in my motel room, talking to you all because when I turned my phone on to call my wife, after a short delay to get service, I got this message. Hey, Rig. Sorry I missed your text. I was in classes all day and forgot to respond. I just got to the hangar because the roads are super bad, so I see I'm already too late to catch you and Brandon. I'll see you when you get back. In that moment, my blood ran colder than the wind ripping through New Mexico tonight. I simply don't know what to think. I don't know who's next door. Reddit, I'm going to be honest. I didn't have the nerve to tell Brandon about what happened earlier because I don't want to lose my credibility as a pilot or cause concern for my mental state. The FAA can be a little touchy about mental health, and a concern from a chief pilot about mental fitness to fly can be a career ender if it were to escalate. Now I don't know what to do. He's in the room right next to me at this dirty motel here in New Mexico, and I, I'm just at a loss. I don't know who that is next door. But I know two things. That isn't Kyle, and we're supposed to fly back tomorrow morning, and I don't know how to tell my mentor or boss friend. Edit, 2032-2112, local time. I took some modified advice to text Kyle, Hey man, how was your day? You doing good? To see if he would open up. I'm officially scared now. I got a response. Not bad, brother, not bad. Tidied up the hangar after I got there. Topped off the de-icing fluid drum and prist bottles. Lacey and I are watching a movie. Note, it's a cleaner we use for our windscreens and debugger for crushed bugs. This thing is officially not Kyle. I went out to get ice and took the opportunity to kind of look and listen at his room. It's pitch black, so it's either asleep or just in there? In the dark? I don't know. It's a scary thought. Edit 2, 2208 local time. The thing is out of its room. It's in the parking lot, still wearing the same clothes from today. I can see it through my motel window in the front of my room by the door. And it's out facing the street, just standing there. 